Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Kai Roshalima. Dr. Roshalima is a very good friend of mine and my teacher. He's the co-director of Phase One Hepatobiliary Program at the University of Miami. Previously, he was at the Moffitt Cancer Center. Dr. Roshalima, hello. Hi, Tony. Would you please explain to our patients what is colon cancer and how does it arise in the body? Good afternoon. Uh, colon cancer is a malignant neoplasm of the colon. Unlike uh, many uh, cancers, it has a precursor. It is um, a polyp. It generally arises um, as a lesion that is uh, highly curable in the colon, what makes the colonoscopy vital as a preventive approach in this disease. What risk factors predispose one to developing colon cancer? The most straightforward risk factor is uh, family history. And the family history may be or may be not associated with a genetic syndrome. Just having a first degree member with history of colon cancer increases one's um, risk of uh, this uh, malignant neoplasm. Additionally, there are some genetic syndromes like HNPCC, hereditary non polyposis colon cancer. Another one called FAP, familial adenopolyposis adeno, uh, coli, that uh, um, increases the chance of developing colon cancer. Since they are genetically uh, related, family members uh, should also be aware of uh, this risk factor. What are your thoughts about the Western high fat diets and colon cancer? So there has been a link uh, between diet and activity level in cancer in general. This has been well related to breast cancer and also to colon cancer. In the past there was um, um, a link between uh, high uh, diet, uh, high fiber diet and prevention of colon cancer, but a, a randomized clinical trial did not uh, clearly show that the high fiber diet was preventive. But retrospective analysis uh, have associated um, higher content of uh, uh, unsaturated fat, uh, animal fat, and uh, <coughs> risk of colon cancer. And uh, this is uh, progressive. The higher the content of the fat, uh, the higher the risk of colon cancer. In addition to that, uh, exercise particularly aerobic exercise, does not need to be strenuous. Um, it uh, uh, is also diminish the um, risk of colon cancer. I see. You, alluded earlier, you alluded earlier that there were some colon cancers that were inherited, inherited genetically. Is there differences in terms of biology and prognosis between colon cancers that are inherited genetically versus those that arise sporadically? Uh, the risk of a secondary uh, colon cancer, by definition, is higher if uh, you have genetic predisposition of colon cancer. Um, depending on the familial predisposition, the genetic predisposition, the risk is uh, even um, higher than in others. Um, in familial adenomatous polyposis coli, it's almost mandatory that the patient undergo a complete colectomy. Um, at uh, some time in their life, and this is very variable according to how pronounced is the presentation of uh, and distribution of the polyps in one's colon. So that's basically a, a straightforward situation with almost 100% of patients with uh, uh, familiar adenomatous polyposis coli will eventually have colon cancer. It's recommended to have a total colectomy. In someone with a history of HNPCC hereditary non polyposis colon cancer, the risk is less than in FAP, familiar adenomatous polyposis coli, uh, and one can be considered just of, to having a segmental colonic resection, but the monitoring of those patients has to be uh, very high because they're predisposed to second colonic neoplasm. In addition to that, that there is a concern of other neoplasias associated with uh, HNPCC, it could be uh, bladder cancer, could be pancreatic cancer. Uh, also, there is a form of HNPCC comoritory syndrome that could be associated with cutaneous neoplasms as well. 
uh, and also one would be concerned with ovarian cancer, and there is to some extent a link with uh, with uh, uh, breast cancer. The most common non-colonic um, uh, malignancy in HNPCC is in endometrial cancer in females. So it's very important that all of these issues be addressed in patients with uh, with familial. Uh, Mm -hmm. colonic uh, nail plasma. So, so generally speaking, which of your patients do you recommend to have genetic counseling or their families to have genetic counseling? <coughs> the criteria is really um, not that straightforward, unfortunately. First of all, any patients that have uh, a first degree family member with a history of uh, colon cancer at an early age, even if they don't fit into the so-called Amsterdam criteria, should be Consider, in my opinion, for genetic counseling. The um, predisposition for familial adenomas polyposis coli is autosomic dominant. So uh, anybody that has a family member uh, with FAP should be uh, evaluated for the syndrome as well. Uh, I tend uh, to refer patients to be evaluated by geneticists whenever they are diagnosed at the uh, at age that is uh, less than 45. Mm -hmm. um, because there's in general concern about some sort of genetic uh, uh, predisposition, although this is not, uh, you know, well defined in the literature. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's assume that a patient has had a biopsy of a colon mass, uh, which has come back positive for cancer. What happens next for that patient? The next thing is that the patient should be evaluated for staging. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are different ways to do it. The most frequent tool utilized at that point is uh, tomography, a CAT scan, an MRI is an alternative depending on uh, uh, the situation of the patient. And uh, after the scans are uh, done, uh, it's also uh, helpful to do laboratory work mm -hmm. um, to understand how the liver is functioning, the kidney is functioning, and also it's uh, helpful for monitoring afterwards to know the level of a tumor marker called CEA. Mm -hmm. The patients uh, may benefit from have that marker monitored after surgery. Should, Should one's diet change after they've been diagnosed with colon cancer? I think that one's diet change all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, high fat diet is not only bad for cancer, it's also bad for cardiovascular diseases, uh, endocrinologist problems, including diabetes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's basically a pandemic in the United States uh, being overweight and uh, high consumption of uh, fat is just one of the components that uh, predispose uh, individuals to um, be overweight. Uh, but in patients with history of cancer, that is even more important, in my opinion, because uh, um, you know there is a link between high fat diet and predisposition of cancer, mm -hmm. and also that it has been a retrospective analysis that showed that patients after uh, having a colectomy that have a low fat diet and a high activity, mainly aerobic activity, have a less chance of relapse than patients with. Uh, a high fat diet or they are, that are sedentary. Mm -hmm. What about the use of daily aspirin in colon cancer? Um, the data is very compelling. Um, the most of the population studies suggest that even a, a dose as low as a baby aspirin could uh, prevent or diminish the risk of colon cancer. Mm -hmm. What about colonoscopy for the patient and their family members after someone's been diagnosed with colon cancer? Again, depends on the age. If one is uh, diagnosed uh, at, uh, you know, at an early age, one not only are concerned about, uh, you know, uh, general predisposition of colon cancer, but also familiar incidence of colon cancer. So, as we discussed, genetic syndrome may be, um, may be um, uh, in the context, and uh, one might need to search for that. But in general terms, uh, colonoscopy is recommended 10 years uh, younger uh, than the youngest first degree relative with colon cancer. So if uh, one has a father that uh, had colon cancer at the age of 50, uh, one would uh, have the first colonoscopy at the age of 40 instead of the general guidelines for an average risk population that is at the age of 50. I see. Would you please explain what is microsatellite instability and how does that relate to colon cancer? So the one's DNA um, repair from damage 
that could be caused by irradiation, that could be caused by exposure to chemicals, or just by the fact that our cells uh, get older. In someone with microsatellite instability, that repair mechanism is uh, not uh, fine-tuned, and uh, the DNA does not repair itself in a perfect way. So those cells are predisposed to mutations. And mutations could lead to cell death, mm -hmm. meaning that you know would not originate cancer, or could lead to a abnormal cell that could grow and proliferate and you know eventually generate a cancer. So um, there is a genetic syndrome we discussed called hereditary non polyposis colon cancer, HNPCC, that the mechanism by which uh, colonic neoplasma, malignant colonic neoplasma are formed are by microsatellite instability. Now the clinical implication of that, in addition to the risk of developing colon cancer, is that in the adjuvant setting for patients stage 2 colon cancer, we'll get to that uh, later in this interview, um, patients actually have a better prognosis by having microsatellite instability and treatment with a fluoroperimidine the most popular of which is 5-FU, or the oral form called capecitabine or zoloda, may actually be detrimental to those patients that have microsatellite instability in stage 2. But this is information is only valid for stage 2 patients. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational. In the upcoming videos, we'll discuss the actual treatment of colon cancer. Thank you.